Let me start then by firstly saying to you, Minister, much greetings to be able to speak with you. We are talking at a very strategic moment for the world, for the continent, and for South Africa. So much is happening that we're, we're indeed very thankful to you for sparing the time for being able to speak with us today. I thought we might kick off perhaps by having a brief look at the big picture again in terms of just reminding us of the fundamentals of DERCO's overall vision and mission for Africa. In a nutshell, what are still the main, the main drivers here for South Africa? As you know, uh, South Africa um, sets out its five-year vision in what we call the medium-term strategic framework, which draws on our national uh, development plan and tries to uh, frame a set of achievable objectives uh, and key targets. The uh, president, when he first announced the sixth administration's MTSF, indicated seven key goals. The seventh and very important goal for DERCO is that of a better South Africa, a better Africa, and a better world. That's the seventh goal in our medium-term strategic framework. Essentially, with respect to the African continent, our uh, uh, key uh, activities are to be a very active uh, contributor and participant in the African Union. Uh, we are also committed to supporting the continent uh, to achieve peace uh, because we believe that peace is very uh, 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 clearly linked to creating the foundation for development. The continent is sorely in need of a stable period in which governments and communities can focus on key uh, development priorities, especially infrastructure, human resource development, uh, and other areas uh, that would support growing and robust economies on the continent. The third area of interest is that Africa does have a development framework, Agenda 2063. So we do uh, take the key phases of Agenda 2063 into consideration when we plan our Africa strategy and look at where we might position South Africa in terms of acting to implement the Agenda 2063 CRE uh, programs. Finally, uh, we also uh, play a keen uh, role in working with the private sector in our country, uh, the companies that have a strong investment uh, on country, in countries on the African continent. And where we can be of assistance, we do play a role. Uh, we encourage uh, sister countries to be receptive of the private sector, as well as state-owned uh, companies, because of the contribution they can make to economic growth and socioeconomic development uh, in African countries. So those would be really a framing uh, of the uh, vision that South Africa has uh, for Africa. More recently, we are giving much uh, greater attention to the implementation of the African continental free trade area, which we believe is a big advance for Africa. Yes, I think that's very important. Uh, and I'd like to explore that in a further question. I'd just like to set, however, your opening remarks, if I may, against the changes in our geopolitical perceptions of what's happening in the world. Um, of course, the whole question of the conflict which we see in parts in parts of Eastern Europe, that particularly we know from everything we've heard now, there is a global economic slowdown, supply disruptions, which will hit Africa particularly hard. And I'm saying to you, uh, if I may, and I'm holding up the, the latest issue of, of the London Economist, which talks about reinventing globalization. And one of the key messages is to reinforce the point that you've made, and I think we've all made, this is also an opportunity to strengthen diversification. In other words, 
that Africa could step up to the plate now and offer things which will be in demand because new strategies are being evolved to, to protect supply chains. And this puts Africa in a much better position to push an agenda there. Do you agree with that? Well, um, I certainly think that uh, countries must always look at where there's opportunity. But I do think uh, you should always be careful about deriving opportunity uh, from tragedy. Uh, so um, while I would encourage uh, that our countries on the continent should look at why it is uh, we are not supplying ourselves with wheat, uh, I you know, would say we would want there to be peace uh, in Eastern Europe and that the people of Ukraine must get back to a position where they can trade uh, uh, peacefully, but the uh, uh, crisis has alerted us to the fact that the continent needs to pay attention to global supply chains and to becoming a much more significant player uh, in a range uh, of resources that are staple uh, resources for the African continent. Um, we also, I think, must look at value addition chains uh, in our economies because several African countries have been able to confirm that they can provide oil, for example. They have significant resources, but we don't have enough refining uh, capacity. So what we can do is export crude oil quite successfully, but we're not able to refine it. And so the value added product, which earns more for a country is not available from Africa. So I think uh, what the continent needs to do is really not to waste the crisis, uh, but also not to become you know, totally self-absorbed because I think that is also a negative. Um, I have said to uh, Durko uh, that we need to perhaps in line with research uh, institutions in the country, look at why it is we don't produce sufficient wheat and how we might look at initiating uh, projects in agriculture on the continent because we have arable land and see whether we can in fact have more grain uh, uh, produced on the continent so that uh, we use what we're seeing to develop not South Africa only but uh, the rest of, of the continent. We are fortunate that our reliance, our staple is maize, and we'd had at least three really good harvests. So our silos are quite full, uh, and we're not in a similar position to Egypt, which is now having to ration uh, um, uh, because they rely primarily uh, on Ukraine. So for me, it's really looking at what we can do and how we might benefit and improve the value chain as Africa. And, and as you also say, Minister, first prize would, of course, to have a more peaceful world in which we can develop these, these opportunities. I just want to pick up your point uh, about the continental agenda of, of 2063. And you've indicated that there are a number of the flagship projects which are aimed at sustainable development, shared prosperity. You've spoken uh, before about an extensive infrastructure build, about the trade agreement. One day we might have a single currency. All those things are being addressed. But as you rightly said at the outset, we, we, we do need to emphasize the extent to which there needs to be a collaboration between the private sector and the government to, to implement and concretize these goals that we've set over time. And I wondered in terms of what you said earlier, is there scope to strengthen the relationship between DERCO on the one end and the business community on the other so that we can be uh, in a position empowered to, uh, to in fact contribute to the, to the development of the continent and also become more competitive? Because at the end of the day, that's also part of the developmental game. I just wondered whether you thought there were opportunities to enlarge the, the cooperation 
between your department and the business community? Yes, well, um, I'm, I'm very pleased that you've asked that question. When I first uh, joined this department, I said to them, one of the priorities for me is economic diplomacy. Uh, we've got to get Africa affluent. And South Africa has a robust private sector, and therefore we have the opportunity to contribute to developing an affluent continent. So I made it my uh, uh, objective to be very close to the private sector. And I'm very pleased that at the beginning of this year, we launched a coordinating body that involves the private sector, my department, the Department of Trade and Industry, Treasury, and Environment and Forestry. These are the departments that are mainly involved in international economic diplomacy matters. The private sector has taken very actively to participating, including uh, their organizations, BUSA and so on. So this Economic Diplomacy Management Committee is a new being that we've just launched but it is serving, I hope, as a coordinating body that will draw value from what I believe our private sector offers. I have seen personally the important contribution that our private sector is making to uh, various African countries. I was astounded, for example, that in Ghana, we have 124 South African companies contributing 50,000 jobs and involved in a wide range of sectors. I won't mention Zambia and many other countries. What I have been encouraging as we meet with the business community is look at countries that you haven't reached yet because many of them are asking, they want to see South Africa because they can see what South African companies are helping to achieve uh, in terms of business opportunity, in terms of access to quality retail goods and in various infrastructure projects. So well, I'm a, an that, ambassador of the private sector of South Africa. Well, I think that that is very reassuring because I think we've all agreed that unless we forge these strong links between, between government and the private sector in terms of this economic diplomacy, that, that the total will be greater than the sum of the parts, as it were. I just want to hone in, if I may, on, on a very important big ticket item which you've mentioned, the, the, African, uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And I have two questions here, and that the first is, with the progress made to date, uh, with our regional integration and, and the stages of negotiation with, with the Free Trade Agreement, what do you see as the further, the further challenges that lie ahead? This is at the moment a, a short ten-year time period that we're working on. Uh, what do you see as still the major obstacles that have to be overcome, and in what way is the private sector involved in trying to overcome some of those obstacles? Because they obviously uh, is an unfinished agenda. They are vested interests. It's got to be very skillfully negotiated, as you say. It's economic. That calls for a high order of economic diplomacy. I just wondered if you could just give us an update, how, how you see it now, and what, more importantly, not what we've achieved, because we have achieved something uh, as far as the trade agreement is concerned, but more importantly, how do we overcome some of the obvious obstacles to further success? <laughs> Well, uh, let me first uh, say that uh, I have been very impressed with the role that the Minister of Trade and Industry has played in negotiating the key regulatory frameworks that will give effect to an African continental free trade area. However, uh, acceding to the free trade area doesn't mean we've achieved everything. It's just the first step. Africa still needs significant logistics capacity for intra-African trade. And uh, South Africa, I would say, uh, we are such an important industrial nation on the continent that 
we haven't yet developed the humility of how we share that industrial capacity. And if we don't learn to establish plants elsewhere to allow other countries to produce, so if we don't diversify and multiply producers, uh, we will cause other countries to become negative about intra-African trade. So we are uh, discussing with business um, how we might, in the SADC region, begin to experiment with what regional industrialization means, how we could share uh, production uh, uh, chains, and how we could support, for example, the expansion of the textile industry in Lesotho, where they have many factories. So I, I think there's a responsibility on the big economies of the continent to really develop regional value chains and to use these as the platform for the bigger continental uh, trade. If we don't do that, I don't see the African continental free trade area working because what will happen is countries will recede into this national sovereignty, which is often a problem on the continent, uh, and then become reluctant to uh, be full participants in what we're trying to do. Uh, and then, of course, I, I began with logistics. We must have railways that work. We must have locomotives that move on those railways. We should have roads that make uh, Africa accessible. It cannot be a free trade area if in Gabon, you can only travel in the capital city and you can't get into the hinterland of Gabon. So all of those matters have to be addressed, but you can do them in step with early trade. I don't think it should put a pause, but it can't, uh, as we begin, we should not forget those imperatives because they are vital to us reaching the level of intra-African trade that we wish to achieve. So, and, um, and, of course, yeah, and of course, those imperatives, you, as you rightly say, you want to create a strategy that it, it's a win-win situation wherever you can, so that everyone shares in the development. It's not one particular dominant partner. And I think that comes back to your economic diplomacy and how one manages the obstacles and the realities in order to, in fact, reach those goals. I want to move to one element of the free trade agreement that deals with, with the free movement of people. Now, yeah. that's a much more controversial issue, not only for the continent, but for South Africa, but it's in the agreement. And before it comes and bites us, what is it that we ought to be doing? And what is the view of Durko in, in dealing with that issue? Because it's not a simple issue. Uh, you may have listed other obstacles, but that that one, one wouldn't want to have that come back and, and under, undermine other achievements. So I wondered, what is the Durko position in regard to that part of the, of the free trade agreement? Well, we, we have uh, signed on to many of the protocols of the African Union. Uh, the one on free trade, both in SADC and the AU, we've been rather reluctant to sign on to. Uh, as you know, we have very serious immigration uh, challenges. We have a lot of illegal uh, migration into South Africa, and many African countries don't have documented uh, 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 records of their population. So one of the things we have been insisting upon is that our, our neighboring and other countries should have proper civil registers of their population. Because when you have documented uh, citizens, a population register, it's far easier to then grant a national passport and allow people to then uh, move. We're not at a point, we feel, that we can accept the kind of free movement anticipated uh, in the current AU and SADC protocols. And that's why we have held off on uh, acceding uh, to them. We are supportive of free movement but it must be of documented persons. Countries must have proper passports and so on. Then uh, we can uh, get to a point where there's free movement. We think it is plausible to have a, a, a free movement uh, of goods, as long as the tariff regime has been properly agreed, 
and rules of origin are very important to us because we don't want to have no tariffs for goods that come from China and then are labeled as coming from Ghana. So we're quite clear on the rules of origin and that this needs to be uh, properly managed. But on uh, the free movement of people, I still think we're a little way off and much more work needs to be done by the continent. So I think one would say that whether one's talking about trade and investment or about the movement of people in one way or another, we have to be sure that the rules of the game are clear, not only from a political point of view, but also for the business community who need the policy certainty that whatever they are doing under certain agreements will be certain and predictable as far as possible. And presumably that is one of the main objects of these negotiations, which will then further promote the, the trade and the investment we want to see in the rest of the continent. Now, I think we have in this interview uh, spoken mainly about the economic and the business issues, although you have touched on some of the other wider aspects of our aspirations. But you have also warned more than once, Minister, that what we are aspiring to in this continent will, and I quote you, only be a pipe dream unless the continent is seen to be addressing the perennial so conflicts that exist in some parts of the continent, and they need to be dealt with effectively because they can neutralize all the other efforts if, if they come to dominate some of the economic uh, and the political outcomes of the continent. So I, I wonder whether you could uh, just in conclusion, give us a, a bird's eye view of, of, of what more must South Africa do in terms of what we've been discussing to get both the future politics and economics right in quotes in Africa. What are the next steps, especially given the shifting geopolitical scenario in the world? Where must we now put the emphasis more urgently than we ever did before? I think uh, we should, uh, as South Africa, offer South African partnership uh, to particularly post-conflict uh, countries, partnership in developing proper statutory instruments and regulatory frameworks. I believe it's very difficult to have stability and peace when you don't have a modern constitution. We are very uh, well, uh, 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 we have many experts who can help in constitution making. So I believe we must lend our history and experience to other countries on the continent as they emerge from conflict. Secondly, I believe we should have a stronger role in helping to resolve conflicts. I would like to establish a peace and negotiation center in Durko because many African countries are sorely in need of differing parties uh, being brought together by an independent interlocutor. We have amazing expertise in South Africa on negotiations, on conflict resolution, and I want Durko to play a far greater role in drawing antagonists, protagonists uh, uh, together uh, in sitting down and actually working to resolve uh, difficult issues. So the way I see it uh, is really let's offer partnership Let's offer South African expertise. Let's share South African experience. What we uh, eventually decide will not be exactly what South Africa has. We are all different countries, but I believe in forming the foundation for peace, South Africa can play an incredibly important role. Thank you very much again, Minister, for your time and your contribution and for your enlightenment on this important subject.